been there a minute. Somebody was like, I'm not going home. I'm out. I'm not dealing with the stress. You get scared when it comes to snow and ice. Oh, a lot of people do. It's so weird. I'm not a huge Civil War aficionado. I know more about World War II than I do about the Civil War. But I know that this is all, this whole area is just packed with Civil War um, battlefields and all the like. Yeah, it's pretty. The gangster. Heavily guarded, and it's black like the buildings I've seen on the. Yeah, I wonder if this is something to do with. I mean, that was this. Funny. <laughs> I don't know why. Even the post office is Jack Daniels.
where I was in Lynchburg, Tennessee, doing a tour of the Jack Daniels Museum and Distillery. <laughs> One thing cool about anywhere I go is people around the world love when you tell them you're on YouTube. The lady was from Indonesia, the man from Australia, and the other man from Greece. And they met in America to go tour America. And they asked what I did, and I told them. And they wanted to be in a video. I said, go over and shake that tree, and let's see what it looks like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So hold on, you guys have never had 2,500 people? We don't have 2,500 registered voters. So you guys can't be... It's never been on the ballot. Wow. Yeah. We, I personally wouldn't want it to be. No, I get I it. I think that's the way it's, you that's, know, it's always been. So. That's crazy. Yep. Okay, sorry, Karen. So that's okay. Um, we got a lot of information to talk about on this bus ride. But yeah, we've never had the vote on the ballot, so that's why we're still in Durham County today. We opened back up in 1938, and every single drop of jacks on anywhere in the world is made right here in a dry county by special permission. Um, we have other special permissions like selling whiskey on the property. We opened back up in 1995. I mean, we opened the bottle shop in 1995. 2012, we started doing sampling tours, but the best special permissions for the employees, we all get a free bottle of whiskey on the first Friday of every month. So we call that day Good Friday. <laughs> Perfect attendance on that day. Well, and we're going to talk about all these buildings coming back down, but our story really starts with Jack Daniel, who was born around 1850. His real name was Jasper Newton Daniel, and he was the baby of 10 children. His mama died when he was four months old. His dad remarried. Jack didn't get along with his stepmom, so he left home when he was six years old. He went to live with a Lutheran minister about five miles from here named Dan Call. Dan had a big farm, he had a general store, and he also had a steel 
which Jack took a lot of interest in. But this would have been before the Civil War, so before emancipation, the steel was under the watching care of an enslaved man named Nathan Nearest Green. And Nathan Nearest Green took Jack in under his wing, started working with him side by side every day, and he taught Jack the art of distilling. Well, one of those processes that Nearest Green taught Jack was called the Lincoln County process, and it's charcoal mellowing your whiskey, which is basically another word for charcoal filtering your whiskey. And charcoal filtering has been going on for centuries. People have used a form of charcoal to filter and purify drinking water for years. So I guess somewhere along the way, people said if it worked for water, it would work for moonshine. So here we are, charcoal mellowing our whiskey. And it, like I said, it's the way that Jack was taught um, to filter his whiskey through 10 feet of hard sugar maple charcoal, and we still do it that way today. But um, back when Jack was making his whiskey around here, there was about 20 other distilleries around all charcoal mellowing. So it actually is part of our tradition, it's part of our heritage, and it's what makes us Tennessee whiskey today. It's the only separation between being a Tennessee whiskey and being a bourbon whiskey. For Tennessee whiskey, we follow all the same strict federal standards it takes to make bourbon. The only difference is Tennessee whiskey is required to be charcoal mellowed and bourbons are not required to be charcoal mellowed. So the legal definition of Tennessee whiskey is bourbon. <laughs> Made in Tennessee, it's been charcoal mellowed. And we make all of that charcoal by hand here on the property. We have two guys that make our charcoal full time. Their names are Darren and Tracy. And they've made our charcoal together for the last 20 years. So if you had Jack in the last 20 years, it got filtered by charcoal there and Tracy made by hand here on the property. And the type of wood they use is hard sugar maple, which is a good wood to use for filtering because it burns clean. It doesn't give our whiskey taste, color, or smell. It filters out grain oils and fatty acids from our whiskey. And we're getting the sugar maple about 30 miles from here. It's already cut, split, stacked up for us when we get it in. And you can see those stacks of wood sitting out there. Those are called ricks. They're left outside to weather for about six months, and we burn four at a time to make our charcoal. The burning takes place underneath those big hoods, which were put up in the 70s by the EPA. We're scrubbing smoke. We don't really soot into the environment, but still burning open air the way we would have done. And only two guys run that all. Two guys, Darren and, and Tracy. Darren and Tracy yeah. run that whole gig. They, yeah, they use 140 proof moonshine straight off of our seal to start the fire. If we used anything else, you would taste it, so that wouldn't be very good. Um, burn time, about an hour and a half. Gets up to about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. They put it out with water hoses. Like, that's it. And that's where the art takes place, because if you do too much water too fast, you get wet unburned wood, but too little water too late, you, you get a pile of ash. So, it has to be the right amount of water at the right time to get charcoal, and that window is pretty small. If you mess up, you can't fix it. So it takes them about 30 minutes to put the fire out and then they'll scoop all the charcoal up. It goes to this building right here where they run it through a grinder to make a smaller, more uniform size piece. And it goes up into this tank right here. They'll drive a tractor up underneath there, fill it up full of charcoal and then drive it up to our charcoal mellowing room. Um, we've got 72 mellowing vats, all 14 feet deep, 10 feet of charcoal hand packed down in there. They have to burn four times or 16 ricks just to fill one mellowing vat. But that charcoal lasts like 10 months to a year. Wow. So it's not like we're changing out 72 mellowing vats a week or anything. We, we literally only make charcoal when it's time to change out a mellowing vat. Can so, I ask one more question okay. about Darren and Tracy? Yeah. Are they like the rock stars of this place? They I mean, totally are, the are they, the, do they have yeah. egos? They, I feel no, like not really, really, I, I, maybe Darren, but not Tracy. I mean, I would, if I was them, I'd be walking around what like, think, John? I think you're right. Darren may be a little, don't say that. Don't I, tell him. I, I won't <laughs> say anything. Tell him that we said that. I won't tell him. Darren more so than Tracy. Okay. I mean, Darren, Darren kind of is though. He, you know, in his spare time, he does target shooting with on horseback. Oh wow! Yeah, he's a mounted cowboy really? shooter. Really? And none of his daughters can get dates out here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would be soaking it up if I was one of those guys. I'd have a fan club, t-shirts. I'd have a WWF entrance everywhere I went. I'd... It's pretty much like that, but they're both very quiet. Okay. So when they walk in, it's like they don't even have to say a word. Like you just know. It would be like Elvis, you know, yeah. he just walked in, he wouldn't have to say a word, okay. you know, he's a rock star. That's kind of how Darren and Tracy are. All right. So. <laughs> but on average, they're making charcoal about four, three or four days a week, twice a day, typically Monday through Friday and early in the morning. So they were done making charcoal probably about <laughs> noon, well, before noon today, um, they were done making charcoal. So, but like I said, this, this, this process was all taught to Jack by near screen. And so Jack learned how to make near, uh, whiskey from Nearest Green. 
at a young age. A couple of years later, Jack had the opportunity to buy the steel from Dan Call, who owned, who owned the steel. And Jack hired his mentor, Nearest Green, as a free man to be his head distiller, which is what we call a master distiller today. And just a year later, Jack registered that steel with the federal government to become legal. And Jack was the first person to do that. So we're the oldest registered distillery in the United States, and Jack was only 16 years old when he became legal in 1866. He had been making whiskey like 10 years at that point. And him and Nearest were comfortable on the coal farm. So they stayed there until Nearest retired. Three of Nearest's sons were working at the distillery. It was growing, and Jack decided he needed his own place. So somebody told him about land here, and he came to check it out. And of course, he's roaming around in all these hills and trees. There weren't no walkways or buildings back here. He was looking for a good water source to make whiskey. And he found a water source so good on this property that we're still using it today. The water actually runs 56 degrees Fahrenheit year round. It comes from an underground spring that's located in that limestone cave back there. So when the water hits the limestone, it'll pick up minerals like magnesium and calcium that contribute to the taste of whiskey, but leave out iron, which would turn the whiskey black and make it taste bad. And Jack knew all of that because of the way he was tall. Yeah, so he saw that cave spring as an opportunity and settled his still right there. Started using the water to mill grains and make mash, which is exactly what we use the water for today. But we haven't changed a lot about the way we've made whiskey since Jack was here. We just make a lot more than what Jack did. But we're still using the same water for us, so. And of course, Jack's whole entire operation would have sat back there at that cave. So this little white building right here was Jack's old office and he built it so close to the cave because that's where he made all of his whiskey. And it's the only building that we have left from when Jack was here. And you know, there's been a lot of history and a lot of decisions take place in this little white building. But one of the most infamous decisions is what led up to Jack's death. Now, typically, Jack wouldn't have been the first person to work in the mornings. He would get his nephew, Lim Motlow, who served as the bookkeeper, to come in early unlock the door, open his safe, and get started with the day. Well, Jack got here first one morning. He was heading out of town. He needed to get something out of the safe. It was early. He was in a hurry. He couldn't get the safe open, and that made him mad. He kicked that 1,200-pound cast iron safe as hard as he could and broke his toe. He did not go to the doctor right away. So by the time he got there, found out he had gangrene. He had to cut his toe off. It caused infection to set up and spread, and all they could do was amputations bit by bit, all the way up to his hip, trying to save his life. Six years after kicking the safe at 61 years old in 1911, Jack died from complications. And all of those complications started right there in that room with that early morning safe. Can we go in? We're not going in, no oh, ma'am. They won't let us get out with the ice and stuff on the ground. Um, but yeah, so first time I heard that story, I was a wow. child. It taught me not to come to work early. You know, Jack and come down, I don't want to take chances like that. So, you know, Jack never married. He never had any children. So when he died, he gave the distillery to his nephew, Lim Motlow. Mm -hmm. And Lim kind of moved whiskey around from state to state where it was still legal until national prohibition hit in 1919. Lim shut everything down here, but he paid bills on the property because of the Cape Spring. He knew he wanted to make whiskey here again. He just didn't know national prohibition was going to last that long, which was to 1933. And then he still couldn't make whiskey because Tennessee stayed dry. So he had to get creative and he ran for public office. He got elected. He ended up on state legislature and passed a bill to make whiskey here. Uh, so in 1938, that's how we got special permission. And he had to rebuild all of our equipment and buildings to make whiskey with. And he died less than 10 years later in 1947. So when Lim died, he gave the distillery to his four sons, the Motlow brothers, and they owned it till 1956, but it really started taking off a lot faster than what they were prepared to keep up with. You know, they were all four Vanderbilt graduates and very successful in their careers. They inherited it at the time. Frank Sinatra is on stage calling our whiskey the nectar of the gods. Oh, wow. They decided to sell, but they sold to the lowest bid offer, which was Brown Foreman out of Louisville, Kentucky. Brown Foreman is family owned and been in the alcohol business for a long time. Back then they'd been making barrels for us for about nine years. And they told the Motlows they would never change the way Jack made whiskey. It would stay in Lynchburg and always feel like a family ran corporation, which meant a lot. So the Motlows sold to Brown Foreman in 1956 for $20 million. And wow. Brown Foreman is still our parent company today. And they own a lot of other wineries and distilleries. But Jack is their number one brand. I imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> So, we've been making whiskey on this property since 1884, and we're still using the same recipe that Jack Daniel himself used 
which is 80% corn, 12% malted barley, and 8% rye. And that recipe makes every single product that we have in the market, except for the rye whiskey that we've been doing since about 2014. And that is 70% rye, 18% corn, 12% malted barley. When Lynn Motlow started building this operation back up, these buildings that we're about to pass by is what he built. So this grain mill right here has 12 silos. Back in 1938, those 12 silos gave us more than a month of runtime. Today, they give us less than 16 hours. So our grain wow. trucks start coming in at five o'clock in the afternoon. They run all night long till the next morning. Um, and we're grinding all of those grains up. We're using the cave spring water to cook them. We mix them all together and we add yeast. Uh, that mixture is called mash. And the mash goes into one of our fermenters where it's gonna sit for about four days. Yeast will eat up sugar from the corn, turn it to alcohol. Um, and then by day four, it should be about 12% alcohol. What does the aroma like? It smells like bread. Oh, okay. Yeah. So by day four, we're gonna be distilling. Um, we have four steels. They are 100% copper. Mm -hmm. Column style, continuous flow, over 40 foot tall. They go all the way to the top of the towers. And we pump the mash all the way up to the top and it spills down over copper plates inside. We're pushing steam from the bottom and it boils the alcohol out of the mash as a vapor, which we capture the alcohol vapor. We cool it, condense it, turn the vapor back to liquid, which is 140 proof moonshine that we distill. Um, we have two larger stills. Each one of those are running on average 35, 40 gallons of moonshine a minute. The smaller ones 12 to 18 gallons a minute and we make it seven days a week. And it'll take five gallons of mash just to make one gallon of moonshine. We, wow. we pull all the alcohol off the mash. The mash is used up, but we don't we don't throw it away because we're 100% sustainable. We have 0% waste to landfill, so mm -hmm. the used mash is sold cheap to local farmers. Mm -hmm. They wow. feed it to their livestock. 0%? Yeah. The carbon is footprint out here. Yeah. Well, our carbon footprint we're working on, but sustainability we're doing really good. Uh, we just purchased a bunch of land and we're going to have some um, solar panels. So we're going to run this whole operation off solar energy. I'm probably jumping the gun, but those black buildings that you go by coming up this way? Barrel houses. Barrel I figured. Yeah. I thought I saw that on the History yeah. Channel special. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah those are barrel houses. And those have to be away from here because of fire, right? No, we've got 13 barrel houses here on this property. Oh. So we've got barrel houses spread all out through the county. We've got 92 barrel houses total. A little over 3 million barrels full of whiskey sitting in a county that's only 128 square miles total. Wow. With only one red light in the whole county and it's dry. So we're definitely the wettest dry county in the world. <laughs> but when all of that clear liquid comes off the steel, that's when it goes to charcoal mellowing. Um, again, we have 72 mellowing bats, 14 feet tall, 10 feet of charcoal. Though a flow rate for the whiskey dripping through charcoal is about a gallon and a half per minute. And it'll take it a couple of days to come out at the bottom. When it comes out, it's still clear, still 140 proof. The charcoal mellowing takes place on that hill up there. Up there. Um, and so all of our whiskey, everything that we make is going through 10 feet of charcoal. And that charcoal is pulling out grain oils and fatty acids. We do have a couple of whiskeys that'll go through charcoal a second time. And the second time is after the barrel when the whiskey does have all of the color and most of the flavor. The second time is only two to three feet and it's just enough to pull out some um, spicy and oaky <coughs> flavors. Gentleman Jack is one of our double mellowed whiskeys and 27 Gold is one of our double mellowed whiskeys, but those are the only two that go through charcoal twice. Everything else just one time. The charcoal lasts like 10 months to a year and we have whiskey tasters that work at the distillery. So we're gonna go up to the tasting lab daily and check samples to see if the charcoal's working. If it's not, it has to be changed out. So Darren and Tracy, they're changing out yeah. mellowing bats. All they right. go up there with the tanker truck and vacuum out that charcoal, Darren. send it off to Pine Bluff, Arkansas. It'll be dried, formed into pellets or pressed into briquettes that are sold as Jack Daniel smoking pellets or Jack Daniel charcoal briquettes. Goes in oh, your grills we, and smokers for uh, food. Yeah. Yeah. We were in Pine Bluff. Okay. Yeah, that's where our, our Airbnb was before we had storms. So okay. ironic. Yep. Yeah, you, you probably don't need lighter fluid with those. They've been having lighter fluid drip through it for about 10 months. So. <laughs> But all of that clear liquid comes out of charcoal mellowing and then it's time for a barrel. Um, the barrel is an ingredient for the whiskey. It's how we get all of the color and most of the color <coughs> is from the barrel. Um, we have cooperages that make barrels for us. Um, bourbon and Tennessee whiskey has to use a brand new oak barrel that's charred. 
but because we're getting barrels made specifically for us, we're not using a generic barrel that's made for everybody else. We're using a barrel that's made just for us. So brand new American white oak, it's been toasted to release natural sugar and then charred, which will caramelize the sugar and make the whiskey taste a little sweeter. Are we getting out Yeah. Okay, I didn't know. Yeah, sorry, Cooper John. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're gonna go in here and watch a video. It's gonna show you how the barrel is. That just looks fancy. don't fit on the other bottling line so that's why we have to bottle them separate they weigh nine pounds when they're full <laughs> and they're only sold in other countries duty free and cruise ships not in the united states i have purchased one with duty free yeah, yeah. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's amazing how cheap it all is
Where to? over 6,000 barrels of whiskey, but it has less than that in there now mm -hmm. because we renovated it, turned it into tasting rooms, event space. We only mature a small amount of whiskey in there now. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. What's the name of this creek? It, we call it Cave Spring, but it flows into Mulberry Creek. Okay. Um, so it's gonna smell like whiskey when you walk in this barrel house. Okay. That smell is called Angel Share, which is evaporation from a barrel. We lose like 20% of the barrel due to evaporation. So we pay taxes on whiskey when we bottle, not when we put it in a barrel, because we don't want to pay taxes on whiskey that don't exist. I was just going to ask that. Right. So when we go in there, we're going to breathe deep and enjoy as much of the tax free whiskey as we possibly can. We're currently paying about eight and a half million dollars every two weeks to the federal government. We're wow. We're taxed thirteen dollars and fifty cents a gallon. We hand roll barrels into a barrel house. Wherever we put them, that's where we keep them. We don't rotate them. We don't move them from floor to floor. They just sit where they are. Mm -hmm. Average time four to seven years has a lot to do with the weather. It has a lot to do with what barrel house it's in and it has a lot to do with what floor. So bottom floor is colder year round. It's like a basement or a cellar. You're not getting as much interaction going in and out. So it's gonna take longer to mature the whiskey on the bottom floor and it would have a lighter color and a less mature taste in four to seven years. But because heat rises, the further up you go, the more interaction you're gonna get. Uh -huh. The top floor, you're gonna get a more rich, bold, and robust taste. So single barrel <laughs> that we bottle one barrel at a time, mm -hmm. we would hand select barrels from the very top floor of the seven story tall barrel house to be single barrel. Everything else, we're gonna take barrels from different floors, different barrel houses and mingle together so that we can keep consistent. And that's how we make old number seven. It takes about 175 barrels to make a batch of old number seven. And then once we have old number seven in batches, it becomes a base for other whiskey. Old number seven is the base to almost every whiskey that we make here. Wow. Really? Even like our single barrel whiskey, it's the same whiskey. It's just one barrel at a time, or we mingle barrels together to make it consistent. The only thing that's different from the beginning is our rye whiskey, but the process is the same. So we have single barrel rye. We have a consistent flavor called Tennessee straight rye. Most of our whiskey is made off of our corn recipe. Now in this first room, you won't be able to use cell phones or cameras um, because there's Vapors. Yeah. We're scared it could call to present the 11th month of the year. Uh -huh. So November 10th, 2020. Okay. That's cool. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. Smells yummy. Now, this wall was put up in 2016. We gutted the other side over here to give us tasting rooms and event space. So when we cross through this door over here, it's climate controlled. We do not mature whiskey over here. All of these barrels are empty, so photography will be okay over here. Okay. This is by far the most whiskey I've ever seen in my life. Barrels from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall. The movie Twister, dude? Yes. <laughs> the most so exciting. We went to Universal Studios and they have that they have a ride there that simulates like all of these like action movies and Twister was one of the movies that is really? Oh, yeah. And we get in there and it's like here comes the storm and you can feel it missing and that tornado is coming right at mm -hmm. you. Like it I had like Did the cow hit you? I, I was <laughs> crazy. <ready to go. laughs> like, like, we got oh, cows. <laughs> and then we were like in the subway and then Subway floods. Really? So the, our, our no. Was, no, we did not. Uh, we're going to be tasting six different whiskeys. It's about, a, about two ounces total. Mm. We had to promote responsibility and we had to get special permission to do this. So, in order for us to be able to do samplings, we can't overserve someone. So, if we let somebody drink four ounces of whiskey, then we've overserved someone. So, we're not going to run down through there and slam shots back either. It's more of an educational tasting. So, I'm going to talk about that whiskey and then I'll tell you to pick it up and smell it. And then you'll want to sit on it. It goes to the back of your throat. It takes my heart that way. <laughs> and on the opposite side, if you only take a tiny sip, you don't really give your taste buds time to recognize and process the flavors. So you do want to sit on it a couple of times before you say, yes, I like it or no, I don't. And in between each sample, it's a really good idea to smell the back of your hand and get a sip of water so that you're neutralizing your nose and cleansing your palate. And that way each whiskey does smell and taste different. And we are going to be going left to right. And that's your left to right. 
So we're going to start with Gentleman Jack. I'll tell you a little bit about it first. Um, it's been double mellowed. It's gone through charcoal twice. Once before the barrel, like everything that we made. And then again, two to three feet of charcoal after the barrel. So the second time, I want you to judge it as bitter or harsh. So sip a little now, say some for later, and we'll come back and try it. Now I'm not very good at taking direction. She said, sip a little now, and we'll come back to it. I sipped it all right then. It should taste sweet, mild, crisp, clean. If it doesn't, it will when we come back to it. <laughs> so that's 80 proof, 40% alcohol. Now the next one that we're going to try is the one that I've been telling y'all how to make the whole entire tour. It's our old number seven, black label whiskey. It's the most popular whiskey in the world. It's sold in 170 countries worldwide. It is the number one best-selling whiskey in the entire world, and it's Jack's original recipe. So we'll go ahead and pick this one up and smell it. I just think there's not another smell in the world that's like old number seven. Kind of caramel, fruit, yeah. oak. And that's when my lack of following directions got me called out. You didn't listen. Yeah. Okay. Never. I like that. Now, you know, when you sip on it, it's kind of sweet towards the front of your mouth. Uh, midway through the tongue, this little prickly feeling, that's the spicy flavors of the rind coming through. You wouldn't have gotten that with Gentleman Jack, because that's what double bell would taste out, along with that oaky finish that you're getting now. A lot of people drink this neat or on the rocks, but the number one order bar cocktail in the world is Jack and Coke. And this one's 80 proof, 40% alcohol. You can finish this one. You don't have to say anything. Oh, okay. All right, so the next one that we're going to try is made with our rye recipe. So everything about it is just like we're making old number seven. The cave spring water, the yeast, the grain, all of it's the same. It's just different recipe, just a different combination of grains. Um, we're mingling rye barrels together and making it consistent like we did with corn whiskey to make old number seven. So we'll go ahead and pick this one up and smell it. It's called Tennessee Straight Rye. Rye whiskey smells way different than corn whiskey. Yeah. Okay? It smells, to me, it smells fruitier. Some people get banana, apricot, I get juicy fruit chewing gum. What's your favorite? Old number seven. Yeah. Now, rye is a spicier grain, so you're going to get more of that prickly feeling. Um, a lot of times rye gets very forward, like you get that spicy prickly feeling toward the front, in yeah. your sinuses, in your cheeks. Um, this one's 90 proof, this one's 45% alcohol. Now, I like this in ginger ale with a squeeze of lime. After you finish that one, get a sip of water and then go back to Gentleman Jack. Everybody except for one person. <laughs> What'd you call me? Yeah. You don't have to. I said everybody except for one person. <laughs> <laughs> call him out. Every time That's we go to the weird in Hawaii, the same thing happened on the, on the cruise ship, or on the, sail, in the submarine and in the helicopter. You didn't listen? You didn't I'm, follow instructions? I, I, I just don't. Can you go back to this? Yes, ma'am. Get you a sip of water and go back to it. You know, so this time when you go back to it, you've had something that's a little spicier, a little oakier. So when you go back to Gentleman Jack, you realize those spicy and oaky flavors are not there. I was, okay. I was going back. You might even have a little bit. Right. Mm. Was it different when you went back to it? Yes, I like Gentleman Jack. Sweeter and mildly, right? And look, if you didn't like those three, you might not be a whiskey drinker. That's okay. Not everybody is. That's what we make these next three for. People that don't normally like whiskey end up liking these. And these next three are the pours. They are whiskey. <laughs> they are whiskey, that, but we've had a flavor to them, so it knocks the proof under 80 proof. We can't call it whiskey. We have to call it a liqueur. Now, our liqueurs, they are 70 proof, 35% alcohol. There's only 5% alcohol difference between our liqueurs and our old number seven. So they make you feel the same way old number seven makes you feel. They just don't taste like whiskey. So you can get a little carried away with these and not mean to. The first thing that we're going to try is Tennessee honey. So we start with the tank of our old number seven. We infuse real honey, praline flavors, and black strap glasses. Like dessert. So y'all go ahead and try that. That's our number two best seller. That's the fastest selling product that we've ever made. I bet. Like me. Mm -hmm. That's good. Mm -hmm. I get that one. A lot of people do it with 
white tea, or in the summertime, I'll do it with sweet tea or lemonade. Mm. That's why I always put sweet tea. Like really? Mm. Cracker Barrel could come up with a weird thing. Have you seen the videos where people like go into Cracker Barrel and they take a photo of themselves that make it look like it's an old timey photo and they do it in black and white and they take a photo of themselves in Cracker Barrel? No. no. So funny. It's I'm genius. Do that. I'm definitely gonna do it now. Yeah, she gets some kind of random photo of y'all. We gotta go back to Huntsville. So yeah, that's do it. Take a picture, frame it, okay. and sneak it on the wall. <laughs> are, you, are you from Lynchburg? Yeah, I live right outside of Lynchburg, so um, I grew up in Next County, over, but it takes me 13 minutes to get to work. Well, you're from you're all your whole life's been here. Whole life. I live in the house that my mom and my brother built. Wow. And the house I grew up in, I could walk to from my house right to cool. now. You ever been out to Oklahoma? I have never been to Oklahoma. Right. Said so I've been to Washington State and Seattle. Right. So I got to go to Seattle. That's where I was born. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it was beautiful. Like our pride. It was everybody says about how rainy and foggy yeah. and stuff it is, and it wasn't like that the whole entire week I was there, which it was in April. So apparently that's super rare, it's rare. that yeah. that would happen. But the whole week that I was there, it rained overnight, and that was it. It was clear. You could see the Olympic oh, Mountains. Yeah. You could see Mount Rainier. Oh, yeah. Which looked like a painting in the sky if you were real. And I, I mean, we have the Smoky Mountains, but I've never seen the mountains. Yeah, those are like legit that. mountains. Those are like right? legit, like, yeah. holy crap, that's a volcano. <laughs> yeah. That's a mountain. Yeah. They're beautiful. You can see it flying in. You know, it was just, it was crazy to me to see that. So I just stood down there and I was like, I've never seen real Alaskan king crabs before. Oh, yeah. So that kind of freaked me out that the, the crabs get that big. Like, I don't know. I didn't. Our Alaskan king crabs that come from like Red Lobster. Yeah. Like, around <laughs> a pound of crab legs in Seattle is three legs. And I have a picture of a crab leg beside my arm. And it's in the meat that come out of the crab leg is the same circumference as my arm. Yep. Wow. Yeah. You can get one crab to meet you. That's not, that's not Yeah, and that, yes. that yeah. freaked me out. That's yeah. scary. Yeah, I was like, me too. Mm -hmm. So we, we were eating at a restaurant where yeah. they were, the boats were coming in from Alaska because they leave the Puget Sound and go out to straight, uh, straight up to Alaska. I mean, it's like a straight shot of it. That's where they go and fish in like the Bering Sea and stuff like that. So they were bringing like all of this fresh like salmon and, and crabs and stuff like that from from Alaska, bringing it back in off the boats. And so the restaurant was just taking it off the boat and bringing it in and cooking it. And they were like, it was taking two people to hold these oh in crabs gosh, to wow. bring in. And that's I was like, that, that's a crab? Yeah. And they were like, yeah, a pound of crab legs is three legs. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so I took a picture because I was like, no way. Yeah. Nobody in Tennessee is going to believe this. <laughs> and then even like the tiger prawns, like the, the shrimp and stuff, like this is the saucer. One shrimp bit on the saucer. Like, is oh, that? Wow. Is that? If Pike Place Market, my mind was just blown. Yeah. I was like, "What is this life <laughs> that I have missed out on?" So it was, it was pretty spectacular. So I enjoyed my time in Seattle. Cool. Tennessee Five. We're gonna come back to get. Go to Tennessee Apple, which is our newest one. That's the last one on the tasting board. It's old number seven, and we infuse real apples, Granny Smith, Macintosh, and Red Delicious apples. Oh, uh, smells like a green delicious. Jolly Rancher. Mm -hmm. Sell barrels with barrels in there. Uh, use barrels with it. But not barrels full of alcohol. We don't sell it full. We will sell you a barrel's worth of single barrels. Okay. Oh, like 240 yeah. bottles of whiskey that all came from the same barrel. Okay, right. that's cool. I'm not calling too many. So now bottles. we'll go ahead to Tennessee Five. That is uh, old number seven whiskey that we add cinnamon from Sri Lanka. It's Ceylon cinnamon. We use cloves and we use candied cinnamon. It's not syrupy, it's not harsh, it smells like Christmas, and it tastes like the holidays. Mm. It is more Christmas. It is definitely it's like Christmas. I mean, it's, it's not like, no, it's, good. it's like a sweet cinnamon. Oh, I like that. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I hope you all have appreciated the tour. 
It's authentic as it gets. They take you right through the factory. Today we didn't get to see a lot because of the snowy and ice conditions. But I'll tell you what, you get the feel and how authentic this town is, these people, and this whiskey. I hope you all have enjoyed it. the car. Look at that. Where the hell's the car going?